As I was thinking and considering our text for this morning, it reminded me of going back to the basics. When I thought of going back to the basics, uh, I, I'm not a big football fan, but some of you, I don't know how many of you would be, be Green Bay Packer fans. Is there anybody? Uh, I know some people in first service gave me, like they canceled me, uh, or just because I mentioned them. But in uh, July of 61, uh, they had uh, lost their championship. The Green Bay Packers had lost to the Philadelphia Eagles. And they were, this was their first day in July of 61 back to training camp. Uh, and so there was 38 members that were on the team. They're all gathering together, ready to dive back into work. And so as a coach, uh, I don't know, where would you go with a team that just lost the championship in the fourth quarter to the Eagles for the first day of camp? For him, the coach was Vince Lombardi, and uh, one of the great uh, football coaches of the day, and he went back to basics. And so what he did in the very first day as he begins is he held up a football. Uh, I was thinking of doing the same thing. I don't have a football. Um, I've got four rugby balls at home, uh, but uh, I don't have any footballs. Uh, and, uh, but I was thinking, so here he was, he was holding up a football. And he said, gentlemen, this is a football. And it just seems like such a silly question with all these seasoned players who know, uh, I mean, how do you get to a professional football team? You know what a football is. But he was bringing them back to the basics. And as I was looking at Ephesians chapter 4, I thought, oh, this is good. This is the church. And it brings us back to the basics of what is church? What is the purpose of church? What, what is God's intent for the church when they gather? What are they on about? Should, what should they focus on? What's their drive? What's their, their focus, their purpose as a church? If you go, to, you can go to lots of different churches all around town here, and there'll be lots of different things that, that churches will emphasize. It seems as though many churches around the, the country, their focus is size uh, and maybe spread, their ability to, uh, to multiply, uh, their, their focus if you were to go to any uh, pastor kind of conferences. One of the, the things that are emphasized is leadership. Uh, one of the things that's emphasized is uh, the, the pastor to be able to tell good stories. Apparently, I need to go to that. Uh, and, uh, and, but that, that seems to be kind of their, their, their focus. Maybe discipleship in a box, uh, kind of a one-size-fits-all type of discipleship model. Uh, and there just seems to be a lot of different things to emphasize in church world. Well, what does God say is to be the emphasis for the church? What's a healthy church? I'd like to know what a healthy church is. This is such an important question for us as a church. Uh, I think this is great timing. Uh, right now is right at the end of summer. Uh, we've noticed that even the last two weeks we're filling up again, and I'm about ready to mention uh, probably starting again next week of like, hey, squeeze in uh, because we're, we're running out of seats in our services. Uh, a lot of people are back from vacations and trips and school starts tomorrow and, uh, and all kinds of different things. Uh, and so uh, a lot of new people, if you're in the Air Force, a lot of people in the Air Force have just PCS'd here, uh, and you're looking for a church, and uh, so you found us. Uh, maybe you're new, and you're kind of wondering about, like, what is this church on about? This is a great Sunday to be here. Uh, I mean, you can come to Discover Summit as well, but this is a great starting point. Uh, maybe it's also a really good starting point or a good reminder for those of you that already call Summit Ridge Church home. If you call Summit Ridge Church home, this is be a text for you to evaluate you and the church. And so this is a, a great time to do that. Uh, and certainly this is going to be a, a sobering, I hope, a sobering text for pastors and elders and, and those of us in leadership. 
for us to be looking at the text and applying that, uh, that this should cause some self-reflection for us as, as leaders and as well as really for all of us in the church. And so this is just a, a, a great time for us to dive in here. Why don't I pray and ask God for, for him to, to lead us. Lord, as we open up your word and look to understand what your word is saying, help us. Apart from you, we will, we, we can just get so sidetracked, we can get lost, we, we can miss it. And so, would you help us to slow down for the next few minutes to actually consider what your word says and, and what does that look like in our lives and in our church? Because God, we want to do what you've said. Your word is your word and it is truth. So may we apply it rightly and well. Help us, guard us from distractions, guard us from missing what you have for us. It is in your name that I ask these things, Lord. Amen. Well, we're looking at 10 verses here, 7 through 16. Let me read for us. Uh, so we have the context of where we're heading. Here's what it says, verse 7. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, When he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fullness. Verse 14 then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So we have here these verses. This is a framework for us to be thinking about what our church should be built on. What is our aim? What, what's our purpose? And so Paul is going to begin here in the first four verses, verses 7 through 10, is he's laying out for us what Christ has done. Here's our foundation. What has Christ done? And so he starts off, verse 7, Now... Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. There is a shift that is happening from verses 1 through 6 and then verses 7 and following here. Uh, it, it's caught by the word now. Uh, if you're in the CSB, which is what we're going off of, the Christian Standard Bible, it says now. Maybe if you have like the ESV, uh, the English Standard Bible, uh, it'll say but. Uh, but that is, it's a transition that's going on from where we were to this new transition of something that, that Christ is giving. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace was given. Not so much in the grace of salvation, we've talked about that, but he's given, he, by his grace he's given gifts to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So this, this purpose of growing up in Christ, as we'll see. Here's what's really important. Grace was given to each one of us, to each one of us. If you are in Christ, uh, we've, we've talked about being in Christ. We saw this in chapters one through three. If you are in Christ, 
you are a believer. That means Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you, and you are now a, a new creation. You are in Christ. This is your identity. When you come to Christ and you believe on him, you trust him, you become a Christian. Christian isn't like, oh, just a set of beliefs that I hold to or think about. Christian is, I am now in Christ. I have a new identity. I am a Christian. And I have believed on Christ. And, and if that is you, he's writing to believers. He says, now grace was given to each one of us. This means to every single one of you who are in Christ, you've been gifted by his grace. You have been gifted. This is for you. This is intended for you. And when I was thinking about that, I was thought, I wonder, now grace was given to each one of us. Do you, do you believe that? Uh, and, and maybe you believe it in the sense of like, oh, of course I believe that, sure. But do you believe that for you? Do you believe that he has given to each one of, to, to you according to the measure of Christ's gift? One of the things I'm challenged with is we come across God's word. It is God's word intended to be believed. It is God's word. It is true. And it's intended for us to actually hear the word and believe it. And so this is for you, Christian believer. This is true for you. And so Paul goes on to say in verse 8, for it says, and he quotes out of, he gives a loose translation out of Psalm 68, verse 18. When he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. Uh, this, uh, he, he ascended on high. This is a, like I said, he's, Paul is picking up the, the imagery of Psalm 68 and applying that to Christ, that, that Christ is the conqueror. He ascended on high. He's on his throne. He ascended on high, and he took the captives captive. Um, the, the fact that he, he conquered over sin, over death, over, uh, over the, the work of Satan, and he has overcome, he has He is the king who reigns, and he took the captives, those who were dead in their sins, and he took them captive. You are now his. Uh, Corinthians says you were bought with a price. He took the captive captives, and he gives gifts to people. Here's the king who distributes gifts. Uh, the, The theme here, Christ reigns. And he goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, but what does he ascended mean? So he's going back to this verse 8. When he ascended on high, what does that mean? He ascended. It means, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. Uh, so what do, we, what do we take out of this? Um, what, what, what I think is important for us is this idea of the fact that he ascended. This is another place where we've seen numerous times in Ephesians that Christ reigns. He's sovereign over all. We see that. He ascended, who ascended far above the heavens to fill all things. He reigns over all. And so there's this question maybe that comes up in this of, uh, well, what does that mean? He descended to the lower parts of the earth. Is that confusing to anybody? Uh, because there's, there's lots of confusion with it. Uh, there's different debates, there's different questions over what does that mean that, he, that Christ descended to the lower parts of the earth. Uh, I, I think the predominant idea and view here is a picture of the incarnation. When Christ leaves heaven and comes to earth and he... Uh, he is fully God, fully man, the incarnation. He's in earth, and this is a picture of his death, burial, and resurrection. So death, he dies, he's buried, and he rises again. And so I I think that's the predominant view. There's other views, but 
uh, this idea of the fact, I think the focus is not so much on the dissension, but the ascension. Death, burial, resurrection, and he, he rises and he ascends into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is a picture of the fact that Christ reigns. And, and I think that's where we want to just land on these, just these four verses here. If there's anything else, is that Christ reigns. He rules. He's in control. He's sovereign. And that's so important as we move on because he gives gifts. And this is the sovereign king who gives gifts to you and to me. This is, uh, I think this would be our takeaway here. What does he do? He cares about the church. What does he do? What has he given? Well, he's given people. And some of those that he's given, some of those believers that he's given are gifted to equip the saints and to build up the church. So here's what verse 11 says. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And let me just mention verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. <clears throat> so he's given some believers who have particular gifts to be able to equip the saints for work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Uh, and, and so he mentions here, uh, there's a kind of a smattering of, of different uh, lists here of apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, and pastors and teachers. And you can break that up into either four or five different types that he, uh, that he, that he lists here. Uh, and then I really wrestled this week of where do we go with, with each of these? There's, there's a bit of, shockingly enough, there's a bit of debate over, uh, uh, well, who are the apostles and, and prophets and, and who are all these and, and does that still happen or not? And, uh, and so let me just say a couple of things. When we say like, when we come across the, the name of apostles, uh, generally speaking, that apostle, apostles, that is a, uh, that really is a, a definition in, in a general sense of ones who are sent in a official capacity. Ones who are sent in an official capacity is apostles. Now, overwhelmingly throughout the New Testament, there, there is a more specific definition often given for apostles that, uh, that, that I think this applies to. Uh, and in the New Testament, there are some specific markers of ones who were apostles. So they would have certain criteria, like they had to have seen uh, the risen Christ uh, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They saw the risen Christ. So that's one of the, the markers of an apostle. Uh, another marker of the apostles that were sent out were ones who also had uh, particular gifts uh, and uh, they do miracles and things to establish and, and, uh, and, and prove the gospel that they were proclaiming. Uh, another marker of apostles was that they were particularly gifted to go far and wide to plant churches uh, and establish the church. Uh, and so that, that seems to be the predominant idea of apostles in the New Testament. Uh, many believe that apostles is a term that once God's word was established, once the church was established, that apostles were no longer, uh, there was no longer, there was the, uh, those, that, that gifting was ceased. Uh, I lean in that direction uh, myself, uh, but there's, there's debate over that. But there was apostles that were given to, to, to build up the church, to equip the saints for works of ministry. Uh, there's also questions over prophets. Well, what about prophets? Uh, we, we see really all of these in Acts. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, uh, prophets, uh, I would say here in the New Testament are ones who are forthtelling, not foretelling. Uh, what I mean by that is 
A lot of times in the Old Testament, we saw prophets that would declare what God uh, is, going, is, is going to do. And so they would often be foretelling uh, the people, this is what's going to happen. You see that with Ezekiel. We studied through Ezekiel. We see it numerous times in the Old Testament. Uh, a lot of times in the New Testament, uh, predominantly, we see prophets, they are foretelling, still declaring what God's word says, and this is what's true. This, they're declaring what God says. So prophets in that sense. Evangelists. We see evangelists today, and I think in the New Testament, we see this with uh, uh, Philip, who is one who declares and makes Christ known to unbelievers. We see this with Timothy, uh, and so we see evangelists. And then there's this, this uh, is one or two things here, pastors and teachers. Uh, we, I, would, I would put these together, pastor-teacher, because of the, the grammar of the, the Greek, and we even see it a little bit in the, in the English. Uh, some prophet, some, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. You see a little bit of a difference there. In the, in the Greek, there's actually a little bit of a difference, and I think those are together. Pastor, teachers. Uh, pastor, here is where I, I personally, I, I was slowing down because... Uh, I'm like, oh, here's, here's where I start to get my report card. Uh, how, how am I doing? Uh, th- this is particular for uh, those of us who are pastors and elders. Uh, he gave pastors and elders to the church for equipping the saints of work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Pastors and teachers. That, that word pastors... Uh, maybe another way to, to uh, translate that word is shepherd. They are shepherds and teachers. They are to shepherd the flock of God. Some of the markers of a healthy church would be ones uh, that have shepherds that are shepherding, pastors who shepherd the flock. Uh, interesting, it's the word shepherds, not, uh, not, not cattle drivers. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge difference between cattle drivers and shepherds. Cattle drivers, they, they drive the cattle. They whip the cattle. They, you know, get them going and move, and, and they're driving them. A shepherd cares for the flock, they, they know the flock by name. They, they care for them. They have responsibility for them. There's a, there's a care. There's an oversight that a shepherd will do. They will give comfort and guidance and teaching. I don't think a synonym for pastors today should be CEOs. Uh, they're, they're, they're not driving a corporation or a business in Church Inc. It's, they're, they're called to shepherd the flock of God. They're pastors and teachers. I would say teaching the flock the way of wisdom. Walking in the fear of the Lord. Which is what Walking in wisdom is repeatedly in Proverbs. That's what they should be doing. To equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. That's the aim. So here's these these individuals that have been given to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Question, uh, who's, uh, I hope you do better than first service. Um, who, who, who are the saints? Evan, I saw your hand immediately. Well done, yes. Uh, it's like, that's, that's me, yes. Uh, you, if you are a believer in Christ, you are a saint. That's you. The role 
of these is to equip the saints, to equip the, the body of Christ. That's their role. That's their aim. It's, it's not to rise to a level so uh, they are super leaders. <laughs> they, th- their role is to equip saints for works of ministry. It's interesting. It doesn't say here. So they're equipping the saints for works of ministry, not to, uh, not to entertain the saints so that they are do better sitting on the sidelines. That's not their role. <laughs> their purpose is to train the people to engage in the body of Christ. And this is the saints for works of ministry. This tells me that this is not just for a few, a handful of people. This is for every single one of you who are in Christ. If you are a believer, this is you. Saints for works of ministry. The leaders are given to disciple the believers in the church to engage in his body. That's the aim. That's the purpose. Here's the framework for us as a church. You have a place in the church, and it's not on the sidelines. I think far too often people come, listen to the message, and do little else. I appreciated what Dr. Howard Hendricks would say. The church is too much like a football game. 50,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise. Watching 22 people on the field desperately in need of rest. (laughs) He calls each of us to be equipped for the work of ministry, and to build up the body of Christ. That's our role. That, that's, that's, that's for you to engage in, in ministry. Engaging in what the Lord has for you in his church, and that has lots of different facets to it. Um, but, but even as you, as you hear... What, what God's word says here, um, I, I don't, my, my guess is uh, knowing many of you and, and knowing some of your stories, there's, there's lots of different questions for you of uh, uh, whether, what this would look like. Um, I, I've, I think there's a number of you here who have been been burned in his church uh, before, and because you've been burned maybe even more than once out of church, you have become a little bit gun-shy to engage in the church again. And, uh, and one, I'm, I'm sorry if that's, if that's happened. Uh, it, it does happen. It, it even happens here. I, I hate that. But, uh, but it, it doesn't negate the fact that he calls you to be engaged in, in ministry in, in the work of the body of Christ. Um, if, if you are here and you've been hurt, I, I am so glad you're here. And, uh, and, and this is, I, I hope and pray, is the place you'll find healing and, and encouragement. Uh, they, some of the others that maybe are here are, 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 are some who are entrenched. You are entrapped in, in sin. And, and so maybe the, the right focus, and this would be the right focus for you. What, what would be your part in the church? It would be, it would be your repentance. Uh, re- repenting and, and dealing with the sin and, and killing sin uh, is, is going to be the best thing that you can do for the body of Christ. Uh, and, and quite frankly, for, for you and your relationship with the Lord. Um, so there's some here that, that would apply to. 
Uh, some have, have tried to engage even here at Summit, and, uh, and we've dropped the ball. Uh, and I, I'm so sorry. Uh, that, is, that is not our aim. Um, and we want, to, we want to grow in that. We want to, we want to do better. Um, so you maybe are wondering, what does that look like for you? <laughs> Sometimes it just takes time as well. Maybe you're fairly new and you're trying to figure out the church and how things work. And um, well, maybe I, I would I would encourage you to to consider the direction that you're heading. Do you have the intent of fulfilling what he's called you to do for us to do? If we really do believe God's word, are we? Do we have the intent of actually following it and obeying it? But, but we're reading here the framework, the foundation for us to build upon. This is the aim. What we're seeing is, in this is, is why it's so important to be connected into a local church body. It really is important for you to connect into a local church body. It's it's what the Lord intends for you. He, interesting, he, he doesn't, he, there's, there's nowhere here about he's calling you to a place of convenience. Uh, he's, he's calling you to engage in the body of Christ. If you're an able body and you're, and you're only online and you're an able body, you are to be engaged in, in the church, you're needed in the church. The church suffers when, when you're not engaged and when you aren't known and you don't know this is what the Lord intends. I don't, I don't think the, the, the Lord smiles when we just float from church to church because you're needed in the church. This is our framework. To equip, to train up, and to build up the body of Christ. So it's to being strengthened in him. That, that build up is the idea of edification. You're being edified. Spiritual strength for believers. I, I, the last thing I'll say to this, and we'll move on to verse 13, but is that ministry is the people. It, it's easy for me to think about, like, to equip the saints for work of ministry, and we think of all the different ministries. We have Summit Kids, we've got the hospitality, we've got small groups, we've got lots of different ministries, and we immediately just think of those. And that's not wrong, but, but that is not just the ministry. The ministry is the people. And, and I think that comes out because it's to build up the body of Christ, not just build up a, a business, not just... Uh, make a big business and and franchise yourself. It is to. It's not to say it's wrong if you have another church. Uh, that's not my point. To build up the body of Christ, it is about the people. If we lose track of the people, we've missed. We've missed. Ministry is the people. It's why I get frustrated at pastors that will say, uh, ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. Ha, 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 that's funny. That's the ministry. It's the people. I think I've said that before myself, and I've been corrected. <laughs> to grow up in him, look at verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. It's seen in the unity of the faith, which we saw in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4. We looked at that last week. Growing in knowing Jesus and in growing maturity in Christ. That's what we should be seeing. Unity in the faith. Knowledge of Christ, growing in maturity. 
in, in Christ, in our walk with Christ. So, how do you think we're doing? How are we doing? What does that look like for us as a church? Remember, this is intended to be self-reflective for us as a church, for us as individuals. Are we growing in unity of the faith? What, what should be driving us and uniting us is Christ, not our, uh, not, not our politics. What should be uniting us is that we are united in Christ. We're long on grace. We're, we're growing in, in patience with one another. We're growing in understanding and caring for one another. You're, we're united in Christ. This is what unites us. Growing in, the, in knowing Christ, the knowledge of God's Son. How are we doing in that? Are, are you spending more and more time with Him? One of the indicators of you growing in Christ is your desire to, 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 to know Him, to spend time with Him. Do you find yourself prioritizing, making that a, a major mark of your life? How about for us as a church? Do we do that as a church? It's possible to even just get more and more knowledge without it actually affecting our lives at all. Are we being changed because we know Jesus? Where the Lord has convicted me and grown me over the... is, is not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's good. Do you know Jesus? How about growing in maturity in your walk with Christ? Do you, do you stay the same or are you growing in your walk with him? One of the ways to evaluate if you're maturing in Christ, I think one of the a great way to be able to evaluate that is are you growing in prayer and in repentance? If your prayer and your dependence on him, so your growth in prayer isn't happening much and you're not repenting much, I'd say there isn't much maturing going on, not really growing in Christ. Change of direction in your lives. As I thought about this, I, I, was, I was encouraged this week as I thought about many of you. I think for many of you, I, I have seen and I've been watching this. There, there are those of you who are here on a Sunday morning and you come and there's a whole lot of suffering that has gone on in your world, in your life, and, and it is hard for you to get here and you get here. That is wonderful as a work of God. Uh, th there, is, um, th there is sacrifices that are being made to engage in ministry when it's, it's hard to engage in ministry and it's easier to check out. And, and I've watched a number of you sacrifice either time or, and or money to, to engage in ministry. Uh, I've watched that. Uh, I've watched a number of you convicted over sin and confessing sin. And I've watched honesty growing. I've watched prayer growing. I remember this, uh, maybe a year ago or so when we started praying together in groups uh, after a message, sometimes we would break off and we do this whole thing. For the first couple of times we did that, uh, I would regularly hear I don't like that. Uh, I know we should do it. It's probably good, but yeah. Uh, now, either you've gotten more refined uh, and, and, and more refined in your sin, you just don't tell me anymore, uh, but I don't hear that as much uh, whenever we do that. Uh, I'd say that's growth. That's the work of the Spirit of God. Work of the Spirit of God is he's been dealing in messy areas of of people's lives. You've, you've led them into those messy areas. Th th these are marks of maturity. You're growing in Christ. Uh, I, I, lo I love watching it. We, we have more to do, more to grow in, but it's, it's happening. 
unifying in Christ, growing in knowing Jesus, growing in maturity. 1 Corinthians 14.20 says this. Brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your thinking, but be infants in regard to evil and adult in your thinking. Um, that, that's the kind of results that we should see if, if we're living out and applying functionally these verses of equipping the saints for works of ministry to build up the body of Christ. The, the results... Then, verse 14, then we will no longer be children tossed by the waves, blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. The markers of, of growing and the equip, being equipped for the works of ministry and building up in Christ, marks of that is uh, you're not so gullible. You're not, not falling for every scheme of the devil and every, every new philosophy that gets out there or, or therapy or technique. One of, one of the markers of, of where God is at work in so many new things is does it require some dependence on God? <laughs> so much we see today is trying to fix the problem apart from God. But if you want to deal with the problem, it can never be void of bringing God into the picture. Uh, he, he will always go deeper. And so growing up in this, it's uh, maturing in this. It is knowing and having sound doctrine. Knowing what God's word says and how it applies into our lives. And, and finally, speaking the truth in love, verse 15, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Literally, uh, a literal translation is, is truthing in love. Truthing in love. It's, this is uh, speaking the truth in love. It's a, it's a balance of 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 truth and love, love and truth. It's this, this balance of that. It's, it's living out truth, speaking it. It's, it's faithfulness. The, the opposite of it would be deceit, deception. So one of the marks of, of speaking the truth in love and you're growing and maturing in that is that you become more and more honest, less and less deceitful in all the areas of your life and heart. Uh, you, you become more and more honest in your taxes. You, you become, if this applies to you, you, you become more and more honest in regards to alimony and or uh, child support. You become more and more honest in uh, actually going where you say you're going to go and, and being honest in your profile of your dating apps or in your dating relationships or in your resume or in the church, in your family, it just affects all of that. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6, says, love rejoices with the truth. So, how are we doing in these things? How are we doing in these? This is our framework. Unity of the faith, knowledge of Christ, doctrinal stability, a balance of truth and love, these should be the marks of a healthy, growing church, as well as describing spiritually mature believers, believers who are growing in Christ. This text is intended for us to do some self-evaluation. How's our church doing? In what ways 
does he want us to grow up and mature? In what ways does he want you to engage in this? What's your role? What is the Spirit saying to us? I thought of how Christ gave, a, in a sense, a report card of the seven churches in Revelation. If he came and walked among us, what would he say about us? I know there's areas for us to grow in. I want to do the things that the Lord has for us. I want to, to hear him. I want us to hear him and follow him. I, for, for me, I don't want to be so busy in ministry that I miss hearing his voice. And that is so easy. And that's just as easy in your world to get so busy. And we are, we are conditioned today to, to, to go mile wide and an inch deep at best. Everything is conditioned in that. We scroll through everything. We, we get more and more information and we know so little. And we, we, we spend so little time to slow down and consider what God says and to apply it into our lives. God's word is always speaking, but will we slow down enough to listen to it and let it map onto our lives? To actually do what it says, to change direction. We can, we can come across lots of nice things, give a little thumbs up, a heart, and it does nothing. This is intended for us to slow down and consider what God has. I want God to speak. I want us to hear what he says and to follow him. Instead of us breaking off and praying today, what I wanted to do is to, uh, to spend just a few minutes and let me pray for you, for us. Um, this very, this, this very word that he has for us in Ephesians 4. Let's, let's pray. Father, I would ask that you, as we have learned in your word here in verse 13 even, of that we be unified in the faith, that we will be drawn to you. We will know Christ. Guard us from just knowing about you, but may we know you. Changed because we spent time with you. God, I pray that we'd be a church that is, that, that is equipping the saints for works of ministry, and, and we are, uh, Lord, we are, are building up Christ the body of Christ. God, I pray for doctrinal stability that you will guard us and protect us, Lord, from, from false doctrine, from heresy, from, from things that will divert us, Lord, and may we be drawn to you and what you have said in your word to be true to your word and changed because we know you. Give us a balance, God, in, in truth and in love. May we speak the truth in love to one another because of an overflow of our time with you, a compassion for others because you have touched us. God, may Ephesians 4 be, be marked in, in this church here and in the churches in the valley, God. We pray that your spirit will move and guide in your church to draw your people to you and to one another. We ask this in the name of Christ and all God's people said, amen.